Welcome everyone to ReFed's new webinar series, Following the Roadmap to 2030, Taking Action to Reduce U.S. Food Waste by 50%. Um, this is the first of a seven part series that really digs deeper into the data and the solutions that are highlighted in ReFed's Roadmap to 2030 and our Insights Engine. Um, each installment is gonna be based on one of the seven key action areas in the Roadmap to 2030. And as we host each new installment every month between now and November, we'll not only walk you through what the data is telling us um, in a more detailed sense, but we'll also be assembling a team of experts who can really help us bring this data to life um, through their lived experiences and their perspectives. And today is no different. So we've got a really great panel on the line um, that you'll hear from in a little bit. For those of you who are new to the network and the community, um, you might be unfamiliar with ReFed's work. I'll just start by uh, a friendly reminder that ReFed is a national nonprofit. We are working to end food loss and waste by advancing data-driven solutions. Um, our vision, which I know many of you on the line share with us, is a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient food system that really makes the best use of the food that we grow. So why are we hosting this webinar series? Well, many of you will know that back in February of this year, ReFed introduced two new and free resources that are available right now on the website. Um, it's ReFed's Insights Engine and our Roadmap to 2030, which really the goal is to support the food systems effort to cut food loss and waste by 50% by 2030. Um, so the Insights Engine is this online hub for data and insights about food waste. It features these detailed cost benefit analyses around solutions. Um, it has um, a directory for solution providers. It also features um, impact estimates and much, much more. In addition, we also introduced an updated version of our 2016 roadmap to reduce U.S. food waste. It's called the Roadmap to 2030. And this introduces a framework that has these seven key action areas, which again, as I mentioned, each month going forward, we're gonna be hosting a discussion that focuses on one of these seven key action areas. And as a reminder, under each of the seven action areas, which you'll find also on our website, we have spent a ton of time analyzing more than 40 solutions and best practices and their impact potential. So definitely worth checking out when you get a chance. Because what we have found is by implementing these solutions, um, along with an annual investment of about $14 billion a year, that's going to get us to a 50% reduction in food waste. Um, that's um, along with this plethora of other impacts that you see on the right side of the screen, whether that's greenhouse gas emissions reductions or water savings, meals recovered and jobs created. So that's what this whole series is about. Our goal is really to get this information off of the page, off of the website and bring it to life. Um, and we really hope that it will support you guys in your efforts to reduce food waste. So today's installment of course is on that first action area, optimizing the harvest. Um, but before we dive in, I wanna pass it over to Dana um, and have her share a few words before we uh, get into some of the nitty gritty in the discussion. Thank you, Alex, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here. We're so excited to kick this series off. Um, we have a lot of information to share with you, and we recruited a ton of great voices to do that over the course of this series that we hope will really bring some of the ideas around these action areas to life a little bit more. Um, and, you know, this one, kicking off with um, optimizing the harvest is a, a really exciting topic. And one that I think is so solvable, you know, we produce more food today than we need, than we need to feed everyone. And I think really finding ways to hone in on what is the right amount of production um, and how do we get everything off the field is such a critical but doable thing. And so we're really hoping that digging in today can help everyone sort of both understand the, the challenge a little bit better, what's driving it, and also just see how solutions really are possible in this particular category. Um, and if you like this sort of event from ReFed, I encourage you to join our brand new Food Waste Action Network. Uh, it's an evolution of what was our expert network and some other groups we were hosting. And it's designed to uh, inspire real action, keep everyone up to date with cutting edge information and um, help facilitate collaboration between people and between organizations across the food system. Um, so today's event is open to everyone, but we'll also be hosting some exclusive events just for the Food Waste Action Network, including um, networking opportunities. We'll be doing lunch and learns, demo days where you can hear directly from food waste reduction solution providers, and more. So you can sign up by going to the link that you see on the screen or emailing us at insights at refed.com. And please share this around. We're hoping to really build a, a whole community as part of this action network. 
uh, with that, I will pass it back to you, Alex. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. Um, yeah, we're super excited about the network. As you could probably tell in Dana's voice, we all kind of share the same enthusiasm. Um, and speaking of the network, uh, we're going to try something new here. So we're going to try a poll. Um, I'm really interested to hear how many of you um, are joining the webinar today and are already members of the network. So hopefully you see on your screen right now, I'm a poll. Um, check yes or no. Um, if you've already signed up and have joined the network, no worries if you haven't. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, let us know if you are joining as a member of the network. I'll give you a couple more seconds here. Great, okay, awesome. Well, 75% of you definitely click the link that, that's on the screen today. We are more than happy to welcome you into the community and hope that you do join um, for more events like this um, that, yeah, hopefully bring more action um, to the sector. Great, so let's, um, let's turn our attention to the main topic today of the discussion. Um, you know, it's this first roadmap action area, really optimizing the harvest. Just um, want to spend a couple minutes on context siding before we bring in our experts for the discussion. So when we say optimizing the harvest, what we're talking about is really aligning what is grown with what is ultimately harvested by avoiding overproduction and then really harvesting as much as possible is, is essentially what Dana said, right? And for wild caught products, we're really talking about sourcing only what's needed. Um, so let's, let's dive into the data. What is the data telling us? about what's currently happening on the farm. Um, so let's do another quick poll. Make sure you guys continue uh, <laughs> to get tested here. Um, what do you guys know about what's happening on farm? Let's see, give us your answer for how much food loss and waste you think is happening at the farm level right now. Is it 6%, is it 21%, 37 or 50%? Give you a couple more seconds here. Okay, so most people think 37% followed by 21%. That's great, awesome. So um, it's probably no surprise to anyone that our insights engine analysis has showed that the most surplus food that's happening um, in the US right now is happening at the household, but the second highest sector for surplus is actually happening on farm, which we found actually was quite surprising at refed as well. It's nearly 21%. Um, so a good portion of you got that answer, good job. Um, but yeah, nearly 21% of all un uneaten food is occurring on farm. This is in 2019, of course, and that's just counting produce. Um, unfortunately, at this point, that's the only food group that we've been able to model um, for on farm at this point, but we do have hopes at Refed to expand that going forward. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but by implementing solutions to reduce the surplus produce, um, we can really cut each year 3.7 million tons of waste. We could cut half a million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions each year, and we can save about 112 billion gallons of water. All of that would result in this annual net financial benefit of $8 billion, which is fantastic. Um, but in terms of destinations for where that food is going right now, what we found is that some surplus is going to animal feed and other destinations, but a huge 83% of that surplus on farm is just not getting harvested. It's simply being left in the field. Um, and what's also really important to note is that less than 2%, according to our analysis right now, is ends up being donated, which I think will be a topic of the conversation as we get into the discussion. Um, what are some of the causes or reasons for this surplus? So our analysis also found that about 23% of the surplus produce was actually considered marketable and edible, but it just wasn't harvested in the end. And we also found that another 28% of this surplus was perfectly edible, but it was just considered not marketable. Um, maybe it didn't meet strict quality standards or appearance standards. So really what we're talking about is over 50% um, if you combine these two factors um, for causes of why that surplus was left behind. Um, when we think about using this data to take meaningful action, um, our insights engine also helps by ranking and prioritizing solutions based on whatever the desired impact is. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the solutions in our discussion. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is some of the top solutions to support optimizing the harvest based on net financial benefit and um, food waste tons diverted. So we're talking about establishing channels to sell or otherwise distribute imperfect or surplus produce, um, expanding what's acceptable for buyers, gleaning or even partial order acceptance. So what does all of this data and insight that I've just walked us through um, actually equate to on the ground? Well, that's what we're about to get into with our panelists. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce um, our panel of three today. So first we've got Lisa Johnson, 
She is an independent consultant. She's an adjunct professor at North Carolina State University. She is a true leader in on-farm food loss research in the US, and she's got a couple of current projects right now really focused on in-field measurement, um, estimation and analysis of food loss, all in food and or fruit and vegetable crops. So welcome, Lisa. Um, next, we've got Derek Azevedo. He is the executive vice president at Bowles Farms. It's a sixth generation, 162 year old farming operation, which a fun fact that I learned while talking with Derek was that that means that the farm was started around the time that California became a state. So that is fascinating. Um, and then last but not least, we've got Maddie Rotman on the line. Um, Maddie is the head of sustainability at Imperfect Foods. They are an online grocer, of course, with a mission to eliminate food waste and build a better food system for everyone. Um, Maddie, Maddie is personally a champion for food access, which we love, um, and she really believes in the need to build a more equitable and regenerative food system. Um, and just a note for everybody on the line right now, unfortunately, Maddie does have um, an emergency that has come up. So Maddie will have to cut out from the conversation. I'm a little bit early, but Maddie, no worries about that. Um, we're gonna dive into the discussion and hope to have you for as long as we can. So Lisa, Derek, Maddie, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so let's dig into the conversation. So we just you know, heard a little bit that nearly a quarter of food loss and waste that is generated at farm level, um, you know, is generated at the farm level. It's about 17 million tons each year. So maybe Derek, let's start with you as our resident farmer on the line today. Um, talk to us about in your experience as a farmer, why and under what circumstances is that food being lost? What are some of these root causes? Uh, thank you, Alexandra. You know, the I, I think if, if uh, anybody who spent any time dealing with the complexity of food waste is instantly overwhelmed by the biggest challenge, which is simply its complexity. You know, the, if, if you wanna, it, it's difficult to synthesize down to simple numbers what the opportunities are and what the specific waste is. Because when, when I look at those slides, you know, at, at the end of the day, and I, I think we'll get a chance to talk about this a little bit more, but, but just quantifying, what is what the opportunity is is perhaps one of the first places to start um and when i see it on the ground there are crops where there's very very little waste from the farm all the way through the supply chain there's crops where there's an incredible amount of waste all the way through the supply chain and so the opportunity really becomes a unique set of circumstances at the field level at the farm level and uh at the crop level so you know a, a close friend of mine had to walk away from uh you know, 60 acres of asparagus, a couple hundred thousand pounds of asparagus, simply because the H-2A workers he had scheduled to, to, to come in to harvest it were, were held up at the border because, uh, you know, the, the government wasn't held accountable for holding up their, their timelines on, on what, uh, you know, so, so it was a physical labor issue on getting it actually harvested. Um, there's a lot of issues as it relates to crop specs that, um, that come into play where, where fruit is either too large or too small or, or um, you know, is, is ripe at the wrong time that I think can, can be tackled um, through smarter contracting and things like that. And then there's, there's simply a, um, you know, just, a, just a timing logistics element of, of food waste. And so that's where um, I think when a lot of people enter this space and they become, an, and, it, and it seems like everyone's drawn to, hey, farmer, what are you doing about this? You know? Farmers are incredibly nimble, incredibly creative, and incredibly diligent about trying to optimize every single thing they grow. The, the, the crops they tend and the crops we tend are just trying to, trying to optimize as much value as we can. And, uh, and we are working really hard. And, and, and the, the, the chain we're talking about here is not three links. It's not farm, uh, you know, consumer, and then a, a truck that goes back and forth in between. The, the chain we're talking about, that messy middle of the food supply is vast. And so in order for us to really genuinely optimize what, what um, you know, the, the good, healthy, nutritious crops that we grow, you know, every stakeholder in that chain needs to, needs to play a role. Um, you know, the, the food supply is very complex. It works very well. But, um, you know, in order to, um, to really capture what we can at the farm level, we've got to work with um, you know, each level of that chain and, and find value for everybody, everybody in there and, and ultimately drive value back to the farm. That's great, Derek. And, and I'm struck by one thing that you said, maybe in passing, but I'm just going to poke on in a little bit. Could you give a, a, an example when you say that some commodities are wasted more than others? Can you, can you kind of highlight that for us of why maybe certain commodities are being wasted more than others? Um, Cer certainly. Um, 
you know, if you get into, you know, like, like processing tomatoes, for instance, they're mechanically harvested, the varieties are bred to be ripe all at the same time. And so one thing that makes me feel good about growing processing tomatoes is that every single tomato I grow on this farm, which is over 100,000 tons annually, uh, has the opportunity to be turned into food. Uh, when I just look over in the field next door, which is fresh market tomatoes, so a processing tomato would look like a sauce or a ketchup or something like that on your plate. A fresh market tomato would be something that looks like a tomato on your plate, to keep it simple. Um, you know, the, those are harvested green, and so all the red ones are left in the field, and all the immature green fruit is left in the field, and they only take the, the size profile and the maturity profile that, that, that fits for the market. So we might leave 20, 30, 40, maybe 50% of those tomatoes behind. If I go to a barbecue and want to impress my friends with, with wonderful tomatoes, I go 10 days after harvest and, and pick like the great big crown fruit and take those and they're delicious, you know, but, but that crop is optimized for the process, you know, for the process of getting it to stores in good condition. You know, peppers might be another one where, where bell peppers, if you're trying to make, uh, bell peppers are peppers in the same family as tomatoes. They have a similar maturity pattern. But, you know, if, if we're trying to target green peppers, all the reds and chocolates get left behind, you know. And so coordinating the buyer for the green with the buyer for the red versus chocolates all at the same time who need to be, you know, you know, there's a lot of coordination that happens. And if those are being processed, you know, that fruit is designed for the machine. Machines need very consistent fruit in order to work efficiently, you know. And so in order to optimize um, the machinery, we end up leaving some fruit behind in the field. And so each crop has its own unique, you know, in, in the carrot example that you showed, you know, my eye was initially drawn to the forked carrot in the bottom left-hand corner, you know, because it's like those, you know, you can't peel those, you can't, you know, can't do a lot of things with those. And so Fortunately, a lot of creative folks have made, you know, juice and cattle feed and stuff out of those, but, but really optimizing, um, you know, each step of the supply chain, sometimes it's that, you know, it's, it's what fits, it, how many number of cantaloupes fits in the box. That's what dictates how many cantaloupes we put in the box. How many, you know, and so a lot of these things are designed to optimize transportation, storage, you know, all of these other things that um, consistency you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks will say, well, if I have different sized melons in the, in, in the carton on the grocery store, we're going to have people all grab the big ones and I'll leave the little ones and nobody wants them. And it's like, well, I don't know, maybe we're not giving consumers the opportunity to be impact shoppers and say like, I'm willing to take big fruit. I'm willing to take small fruit because I know that this diversity is giving me an opportunity to make a difference. That's awesome. Um, and definitely, we are going to have a lot of time to talk about solutions. So that's a great um, point there, Derek. Before we transition into solution, Lisa, maybe I'll kick it over to you just because you've done a lot of work and research in this space. I'd love to see if there are other challenges that you've identified on some regional or national scale, given the work that you've done. Um, what are some of the critical challenges you think still need to be addressed? And I am really specifically curious as to what you think. Um, about whether or not what we're really trying to do here is solving for the overproduction on farm um, as a concept. How do you respond to that? I think you're on mute, Lisa. There you go. Yeah, hi, um, thanks for having me today. There are still lots and lots of challenges to understanding food loss on farms. Uh, the very first of which it's, it's incredibly rare for a group such as this today to hear from a grower. And so I'm really thankful that Derek is here to share his firsthand experience. Um, much of my work has focused on what happens on farm. And so translating grower perspective into something that people are, are willing to listen to. Uh, so I'm really glad again to have Derek here to tell you uh, firsthand. So um, one of the things that we're still lacking, unfortunately, even though we have this great new resource in the insights engine, is specific data. You know, um, I don't know if you've heard the saying, there are as many different kinds of gardens as there are gardeners. It's similar with farms. There's a lot of nuance in farms all around the country. And if I say farm to someone, they might think of a uh, you know, a cornfield or a cattle farm, they don't think about maybe a fruit and vegetable farm like I do, right? So then further, there's about 400 different types of fresh produce grown in the U.S. And so it's very difficult to come up with blanket numbers 
that reflect what's happening around the country and with each and every crop. So I'm excited that the Insights Engine is, um, is sort of presenting data in the way it is because it's digestible and it can get people really excited. But I want to stress that there's still so much data needed, uh, in particular at the farm level. Um, I have done research in North Carolina, and that research gets translated nationally. Uh, and so you can see how that may or may not be a good thing, right? So, you know, I'm very cognizant of that. I feel like it's important to get a lot more data. Um, but to your question about overproduction, yeah, you know, one of the things that we don't hear very much is the perspective of growers. And so what ha ends up happening is we get really prescriptive about what growers should do to uh, reduce food loss on farms. And our main resource that we have uh, as a starting point is the EPA's food recovery hierarchy. At the very top, it says to reduce the source of the excess, right? Which translates loosely uh, to agricultural production as to not produce so much. So I think many people feel confident in saying to growers, oh, you should just not overproduce. In reality, there are so many reasons why a grower plants the amount of food they plant, including the number of customers they had the year before, the opportunity for a market to pop up out of nowhere that they want to serve, even the lack of really effective crop insurance for fruit and vegetable producers really, um, really creates a situation where they have to back themselves up uh, against risk. So for example, if a hailstorm takes out a crop that's halfway uh, developed, you should have another, another planting that's two, four, six weeks behind that in order to provide insurance to yourself. So I want to uh, sort of caution against saying we need to stop growers from overproducing because it's just yet another way we're blaming growers for factors outside of their control, such as market or weather. That's great, Lisa, and I, I appreciate you kind of bringing that perspective to this, um, which came up in our previous conversation. So really wanted to make sure that we kind of got that out there and we all keep that, that in mind. Um, well, so as you know, I shared earlier in the presentation um, and the point of this call today is really to talk about how do we optimize the harvest in the face of these challenges and realities that um, exist on farm. Um, having just heard about some of these challenges, um, let's talk a bit about those solutions now, starting with two of the top solutions um, that came out through the data and the, the analysis that we did, which are imperfect and um, surplus produce channels, as well as buyer spec expansion. Um, so Maddie, maybe let's kick it to you. Super excited to have um, you on the line to represent Imperfect Foods. And you guys know a thing or two about developing Imperfect um, and surplus produce channels. So could you share a little bit about Imperfect's relationship and interaction with producers? Um, what percentage of the food that comes through the warehouses is off spec? And are there opportunities to share some best practices with other retailers um, or grocery uh, outlets? Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. It's so great to hear sort of Lisa and Derek's perspectives because it really takes all of us coming together to figure out what the solutions are. And, you know, at Imperfect, we are a full service grocer delivering direct to customers' doors, but we're really trying to reimagine grocery for a kinder, less wasteful world. And for us, what that means is partnering with growers and, you know, hearing Derek talk about how the tomato harvest works and processing versus sort of fresh fruit tomatoes and all of that timeline of when to harvest, when to pack, when to deliver, optimizing, you know, even car cartons or trays. Um, those are the conversations we've had over and over and over again for the past six years. And it, you know, while it can be scary and sad to realize what the, what the typical outlet of that conversation becomes, Imperfect really um, aims to be a solution here. So we hear those conversations and say, great, pack those for us. Um, help us take that 20 to 30 percent that's lost or maybe not hitting spec and give that to us and let us change consumer behavior and build new markets and sort of become that logistics solution um, to the food waste problem. Because so many of these challenges that we hear over and over from growers, including Derek, it's, you know, we have the field, we have folks able to harvest at this time, we'd love to optimize that harvest and be able to pick those number twos as imperfects, those off shape and off size at the same time. 
And we want folks to optimize their harvest at that point to pick for us. So, you know, pick your number ones to the right and then pick your imperfects and odd shapes and sizes to the left for us um, and enable us to sort of be up front to consumers and enable them to, you know, choose to be an impactful shopper um, and sort of enable growers to be able to harvest everything and also provide that, you know, I think Derek said it really well, um, you know, give back across the entire supply chain in that moment. Um, because when we can optimize that first harvest through new specs, through new channels, through new market avenues, we actually give back to the farm uh, from a resource perspective, to the growers for being able to pick more um, and, you know, sort of truckers and every sort of piece along the path. Um, we want to make sure if we can take everything in that moment of harvest along the whole chain, we get to give back um, and create new market revenues. That's great. Thanks, Maddie. Well, just maybe a, a quick detour here going off of what you were, were sharing, Maddie. Um, you guys obviously have found a market for imperfect um, products. Derek, I guess question to you would just be, are you seeing that buyers overall, the ones that you're working with outside of imperfect, are actually starting to be flexible in negotiating product spec? Um, are you finding that they're more open to some of those off spec products or are you still finding some resistance there and, and really hopeful that maybe there'll be more uh, sales channels later? But Share with us a little bit about what you're seeing in the market. No, I, I would say there's still a, a fair amount of resistance there. And again, it's, um, you know, to, to the extent there's, there's pressure on labor and there's more drive to, um, you know, handle things through processing and things like that. Again, it puts even more pressure on uh, even more narrow specs to set it up for the machinery. And so, you know, we, we work with a lot of really uh, creative, um, you know, just world-class companies and, and they are open to that discussion, but the margins are so thin, anything outside of the normal scope of business just, begets, just becomes really costly. And so, so aligning solutions that, that fit with the normal course of business um, really are a lot more cost-effective. Maddie laid it out really well and in a practical setting in the field, you know, one thing I've, I've done is, you know, it, it, it costs, you know, say it costs you $5,000 an acre to grow, you know, to grow a crop, it'll cost you another 5,000 just to harvest it. And so if you go through it and that's harvesting the good stuff, if you want to come back after the harvest with a cleaning crew, that harvest cost might be double or more, you know, you really want to, you know, we don't have unskilled labor on the farm. The, the, the people cutting watermelons are among the most skilled artisans in their craft that we employ. And, and the efficiency and speed at which they can capture that fruit and do it in a cost-effective way is, is a missed opportunity if you don't loop them into part of the solution. And so, so cutting the good stuff along with the scars at the same time and getting it up into the shed and then diverting it at that point into separate containers is a far, far more cost-effective solution than to try to go after the fact and rescue wasted fruit with volunteers and all of this other stuff that, that, that is just, it's, it's too expensive, too dangerous, too costly and, and, and too risky to participate. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's great, Derek. Thank you for that. Um, well, maybe a bit of a spin, something that I haven't really uh, heard come up in the conversation so far is about donations. So let's spend a couple minutes here talking about um, and, and open to anyone um, on the call, you know, how do donations play um, into all of this of getting some of this food off a of farm, whether it's imperfect or otherwise, how viable a solution um, is fresh produce donation? And what are some of the obstacles that still need to be overcome when we're talking about um, some of this product for donation? I can go ahead if you like. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Um, well, do donation is another one of these areas where we're prescribing for growers uh, that they really should donate. And I am guilty of asking growers this question myself. Have you donated anything? And what I learned in working with sociologists uh, throughout my research is that there's a blame-free way to ask this question. And that is, what is your experience with donation? Uh, in talking with growers, I have found out that not everyone has a great experience with donation. In many cases, it costs the grower money to either harvest or transport something that they want to donate because they feel good about doing that, right? 
Uh, in many, many states, the tax benefit is not enough to cover their costs, and so they are losing money just because they want to donate. And, you know, many of the people on the line have their own businesses or participate in their own businesses. You know, how would you feel if someone said to you, you really should just give away some of your money instead of keeping it? You know, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Now, many growers appreciate the avenues that are there, uh, but it would work a lot better and more growers would do it if there were incentives to donate that at the very least covered their cost to harvest and in many cases sort and pack. Uh, what people often don't realize is the packaging growers use is itself very expensive. And so when you ask growers, you know, to donate a pallet or whatever, there's more that goes into it than just the fruit or vegetable. Important to remember. That's great, Lisa. Maddie, what would you add to that? Yeah. No, and I, I think that you covered so well, Lisa, but I think one of the other challenges that we haven't shared yet is, is the infrastructure of the nonprofit space and who is able to accept these donations. Um, at Imperfect, we have a really robust uh, relationship with both food access folks sort of um, that do same day delivery as well as some larger food banks. Um, we work with over 75 uh, different nonprofits across the country to provide food access in our communities. But working with them, we understand the nuance and challenge of what they have from an infrastructure level. Um, we go through and sort hyper perishable items um, to folks that may be soup kitchens that can cook things versus um, hardier items for food banks. Because right now there's about a five to seven day delay at food banks for processing all of the product right now because there's such a need. And so sort of making the assumption or often there's the assumption that there's excess food and there's so many folks in need of eating. Um, this is a silver bullet donations. Um, and it's not true because the infrastructure and needs across the chain of everything from price of packaging to freight um, and harvest as Derek mentioned, to as well the infrastructure of sort of the food access partners and what they're able to process and bring through and give out. Um, there's so many steps along the way that also need to be optimized. Um, and I think that that's, it's both the infrastructure piece and then also the size of it. Um, if we look at sort of the insights engine to really highlight how large the, you know, weight or revenue of excess and surplus food and uneaten food there is in the US, it's around 2% that's getting donated. To be able to scale that up is so large. Um, and so creating sort of multiple revenue channels and multiple marketing channels to be able to provide this food to consumers um, is where Imperfect thinks that there is opportunity because we, we can purchase this food, um, provide more you know, revenue through the supply chain, but also partner with nonprofits and food access folks to find ways to help them optimize their solutions. Um, but it really isn't a one-to-one -one answer. All right. Derek, anything you would add from your experience? Yeah, again, like I, like I mentioned, sometimes the, the cost of harvest doubles your investment in, in the field. And if you look at the inflation that we're dealing with, you know, just, just the cost of a pallet. You know, I paid $7 for pallets last year. I was quoted yesterday for a, a pallet, one pallet costing $40. Um, trucking rates are double where they were last year. You know, the, the people that we have access to, 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 you know, to do some of these jobs on the farm is, is limited and scarce. And so, um, and, on, and on top of all of those things, you know, you're already asking one of the most generous groups of business owners to give even more. And, you know, I, I, I did a comparison to a, a, a global food company who was bragging about the $7 million they gave away last year. And I looked up their, their profits and I, I did a ratio. And if, if, if you did the same thing on our farm, you know, we were, we were 36 times more generous than they were. And, um, and, and you just don't hear farmers brag about that stuff. I, I work with a lot of food banks um, and, and I, will, I will say, I have nothing but respect for the folks that deal with food banks and their little network. I mean, these people are up all night long. They're, they're probably the most passionate group of folks. And so I work with them a lot and we, we give away a lot and we coordinate a lot and deal with all the little loads and stuff. And, and it's, it's because I'm, I'm generally, um, you know, I'm generally just inspired by, by the people, and, um, but it is uh, uh, really problematic. And, and, and there have been many times we've been turned away by food banks because they just don't have the room or they don't have the cold storage or they can't handle 80,000 pounds of watermelons this week. And, and so 
um, you know, really kind of creating some excess capacity in that system would certainly help to, to alleviate some of the strain that they deal with. But um, I will say one thing that the, 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 the people involved in the food banks and, 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 and that, like I said, that little network is, is, is an in, a really impressive group and you can't help but, uh, but fall in love with them, I'll tell you. Thank you for that insight, Derek. Um, I do see and continue to see a lot of questions coming into the chat, which look fantastic and great. So thank you, keep those coming um, for sure. And we'll try to incorporate as many as possible here. Um, in the meantime, um, what I wanted to ask the group here, so again, open to, to any of the panelists, let's talk about other solutions, um, both the sexy ones and the non-sexy ones um, that maybe can come to play when trying to optimize um, the harvest here. Let's think about whole crop contracting, um, partial order acceptance, labor matching, et cetera. Anything from the panelists um, about some other innovative solutions that you've either tried or are um, researching or seeing out in the, the field right now? Can jump quickly because um, yeah, so I think for us, a lot of the the innovation or sort of not sexy concepts that we've started bringing forward is um, it's whole crop crop contracting, but also in processing. So for us, figuring out at a perfect, we're sort of following the waste, and so finding along the supply chain where the waste is. So for example, we're about to launch a line of um, salad kits but using all of the excess pieces of kale stems and broccoli that's not being used right now. And so it's going to processing and then becoming waste along the way. Um, and so finding ways to bring those back into the fold along the supply chain, um, or even taking food that's been semi-processed, um, so gone from the farm to a processor, and then is being wasted. Um, so that's everything from our pretzel bits where we've gone away from just produce, but we've taken wheat, we've taken corn, we've processed it into something. It's now being lost. And how can we cover pretzel bits in chocolate and make them into a new product? Because we don't want to lose all of the sort of emissions energy cost along the chain um, as well. So those are some of the newer pieces of finding in processing how we can save food um, and continue to continue to upcycle it truly um, along the chain. I, you know, I would say it's, it's a lot of farmers overlook some of the things that um, they're just doing. You know, we, um, we're constantly looking for creative ways to, to, to find outlets for our stuff. You know, we, we work with a local sheep farmer where we sell graze. Like if we have a leftover field of cantaloupes, we'll, we'll sell graze that and feed that off uh, for livestock. Um, it's challenging with food safety. And so it has to be a certain distance and all this other stuff, but, you know, we'll feed that off. Um, you know, the food industry is incredibly skilled at anything that has nutritional value for livestock is going to livestock. Very, very little of uh, food that isn't contaminated with waste, like forks and spoons and all kinds of other stuff, um, is already going to livestock. They're an incredibly efficient sector. Um, you know, some of the things I've done, uh, like our kale and cilantro last year after it was done being harvested in the fall, we grew that out uh, over the winter and used and we just allowed those plants to regrow and use those as our cover crop. Instead of tilling those and allowing those to go back in, we just utilize that plant live root to feed our microbes and, and, and utilize that as our, as our cash cover crop, as I call it. Um, you know, and then just creatively interacting with, you know, with local chefs and things like that. You know, we had a bunch of melons that, watermelons that were ripe and they're a little bit bigger than a softball. A bunch of them and it was just a kind of a one-off thing and fortunately we have a really creative chef nearby who came and, and bought a whole bunch of those and he chopped the top off and he he made watermelon margaritas and and, and served them inside the watermelon uh, shell itself you know and so there are some creative folks out there but it's really difficult to 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 get that to scale and and to get that you know and, and i told him i said even if you love these i can't promise i'll have them again next year you know, and so having um, the opportunity to work with different folks that do have the ability to be nimble is encouraging. And so that's why, but when I interact with the crop buyer, I get the no. But if I interact with a chef, I get the yes. You know, and so chefs ultimately guide the culinary trajectory of, 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 of all of us. And so kind of using some of their resources to figure out just how we can incorporate some of the, you know, less than perfect produce into our food supply. I mean, that's, that's what I take home to my family. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, I'm really excited all the time about ReFed's innovator database because anyone who is purchasing 
a surplus product from the farm is helping farmers to sell more of what they have grown. And in, in that sense, reducing food loss and food waste. So I'm really excited about all the new startups and consumer packaged goods that come about that have a mission and make a statement and their customers are making an impact. Um, so of course I'm in favor of all of that. Um, however, my work is on the exact opposite side of the scale of when it comes to being interesting. I work in data and measurement. And so uh, one, of the, one of the solutions that I um, work on is preventing food loss in the first place uh, because measuring food loss and food waste is the tool for reducing it, uh, which was a fate, which was a quote by my friend and fellow food waste leader, Andrew Shackman. He said, the measurement itself is the tool uh, to reduce food loss. And I've employed that strategy on farms and it's the same exact outcome. The instant growers see the numbers put to what is uh, not being used on the farm, they're interested in using it and uh, want to make a difference with that produce. And so I'll just mention some of my projects really quick. It's, you know, related to another question, but all of my work has to do with measurement. Uh, in Tennessee, I'm working on a project that utilizes gleaners to collect data on the ground because they're on the ground at the exact right time, uh, right after the crop has been harvested and before it's disked in. So they're going to be collecting data on uh, what is left behind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in collaboration with World Wildlife Fund and Measure to Improve and Kai Robertson, we are working to arm growers, to empower growers to do measurement in their own fields. And so providing them with a food loss calculator and tutorial to go along with that. So any field, any time growers are interested in seeing what's left out there, they're able to take those measurements uh, on their own. Um, and in collaboration with the Consortium for Post-Harvest Innovation and Food Waste Reduction out of Iowa State, we are working to automate data collection on food loss in sweet potato in North Carolina starting this year using remote sensing, uh, commonly known as drones. So very exciting projects, all related to measurement. When we when we measure, we can manage, right? And this is the mantra uh, among food waste enthusiasts for so long, uh, but it's true. When we know what we're dealing with, the scale of what we're dealing with, we can design a solution that fits at that scale. I, I commend every mobile jam maker that tackles, you know, the strawberries that are left in the field and, and, and sells at a boutique shop. That's wonderful. Um, but what I would really like to see, you know, is every berry being harvested and used. Um, so I know data and measurement as a solution. It's not, not that interesting, but it's there. <laughs> well, you know, Refed is not going to ever contradict you in that sense, Lisa. We're all about the data, so appreciate you plugging it. Um, we have hit the 45 minute mark. Madeline, I know, needs to, um, to head out. So Maddie, thank you so much for joining us. I um, really appreciate thank hearing you your all. perspective. Yeah, so but great. we will continue Thank the conversation here with Lisa and Derek. Thanks, Maddie. Um, okay, so one thing that neither of you kind of latched onto in my long initial question, I'm gonna poke on it again because it looks like um, David from Uproot Colorado also had the same question. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on the idea of whole crop purchasing or whole crop contracting? Um, is this a myth? Is it a realistic solution that we should be encouraging um, for the sector? Do either of you have thoughts on that? Certainly, I, I do, um, and 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 this is something that uh, I was just reading over the questions too, and I thought David pr proposed a great one. Um, and I do think when I when I say the opportunity to do smarter contracts, you know, ultimately that's what I mean. You know, in a lot of ways, um, we're speculating on some of the crops. Some of the crops we grow, we won't plant without a contract in our hand. Other ones, we're kind of speculating based on what we think the market's going to do, or based on last year, this or that, and. And, um, and so you never really know what else is out there. And so I look at it like, like 
some of these retailers, they know year over year what their consumption is on various categories and things like that. And, and, and it doesn't, you know, it ultimately it benefits them if there's excess capacity and they can drive down the, the or if there's excess supply and they can drive down the price. It also, it also supports the volume. But I do think there's an opportunity to, to have a win-win in that discussion. I mean, I, I don't, I don't need to sell my cantaloupes for top dollar, um, you know, if I'm selling 80, 90, 100% of them. You know, I can sell them at a discount if more of them are moving, which provides more cost-effective nutrition into the supply chain. But if, but if you're only going to take 40, 50, 60%, then I'm going to need X, Y, Z dollars, you know? And so having the opportunity to build a bigger pie in order to share, I think is a really smart angle and, and one that can be solvable. Like I said, I don't have the consumption information. I don't have the acreage information on what's out there. I don't have that control. And so I'm trying to do the best I can, but, but sometimes it's really difficult. My watermelon buyer one year asked me to plant 800 acres of watermelons. I was like, no, I'm not comfortable with that. I planted 300 and they barely got those sold. You know, if I had planted 800 acres worth, that would have been a $5 million, you know, you know, you, you know what I mean? That, that would have been a big problem. This is, this is supposed to be kid friendly, Derek. So don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, I mean, but, but those are, I mean, that's an example of, of, of the type of, um, you know, the, the type of range that's out there. And so having, you know, having more honest, transparent, strategic discussions with folks and not to, and not that they don't exist. I mean, we're working with some of them and we are doing contracts on some of these and, and, and they are successful, but they could be better. Understood. Anything to add, Lisa? Yeah, I, you know, with whole crop contracts, I would say it's not a myth, but I think it's a little bit still in the future. And uh, I know that there are some retailers interested, for example, those participating in the 10 by 20 by 30 uh, campaign. But I think that that kind of contract is probably better suited for a distributor or processor or something like that, where they could take the range of quality and not um, put it all in the grocery store until we know that consumers are ready for that. Uh, it kind of leads into one of your other questions, would produce of lesser appearance quality sitting right next to the high quality uh, appearing produce in the grocery store cannibalize those sales, which is a common concern among growers. Uh, and, you know, I really don't think that that would happen, first of all, because typically that produce of lesser quality doesn't go to the retailer, which has the by far the highest standards for visual appearance quality. They would go to a food service or distributor or something like that. Uh, but if they did, I think we would see something radically different than what we expect. And I would hope that it would create a brand new group of consumers or customers who are eating produce for the first time, who were not able to afford it previously, and suddenly now have access to a lower to it at a lower price point. Um, so at any rate, whole crop contracts are out there. I know several people working in this area. I think it's really exciting, and I think it's a little bit in the future still. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you both for that. Um, you know, it looks like we've got several um, government agencies on the line and representatives from the government side on the line. So I, I do want to ask a question um, about levers. Um, so at ReFed, you know, we do a lot of work to support the various levers that are really needed to help um, accelerate adoption of solutions, whether that's financing or funding, whether that's more research and data, as you pointed out, Lisa. I think another really important lever is policy and legislation. So do either of you have a perspective or thought on what, you know, municipal or state um, level agencies um, policies can do to support, you know, the optimization of the harvest. Yeah. Is that go first? I think, um, you know, I think, uh, I think Aldo Leopold said it best when he said, you know, the, um, you know, the, you know, the, the ultimate conservation is that is to reward the, the private landowner, in this case, business owner that protects the public good. And, um, you know, I think there is a lot of opportunity to, you know, like, 
like the H2A issue I mentioned earlier. You know, the people who work through the H2A program uh, are held to very high and strict standards. And, and it was the government that fell short in, in, in holding themselves accountable to the same standards and, and, and following through on their part. And so um, part of that uh, would certainly have prevented the loss of a lot of food um, in our part of the world. And the other part is just, you know, rewarding those that are genuinely trying to, trying to do the best they can. California, especially where I farm, is in a very, um, the regulatory burden at which we farm is, is very uh, cumbersome. And it drives, you know, and I'm not complaining. I think a lot of farmers do get caught up in complaining. And, and to be honest, a lot of those regulations are good public policy. Like, you know, I, I want my workers to have access to, to, to cold water. And, and bathrooms within walking distance of where they're working and health benefits and you know paid sick time if they need it and all the other stuff that we supply to our employees, but it does increase our cost. And so it is difficult to, um, to provide all of that, to provide all the regulations on the chemicals we apply. I mean, just to do business in California as a farm, you probably have to comply with over 100 individual regulations. And, and, and the regulatory burden of that is hundreds of dollars per acre every year. And then you go to the store and there are, you know, fruits and vegetables alongside of ours that come from other countries who are not held to those high standards. And, and it's really challenging because it, it really penalizes those of us who are doing everything as best as we possibly can and providing an excellent food source. And so, you know, having some, you know, relief for, you know, just, you know, you know, like, like I said, just having, having some more incentives for, you know, that the tax credits for donating to the food bank are good, but they're not a, enough. Or having, you know, some more of that regulatory wind at our back, just some positive news coming from, you know, coming from lawmakers, just saying we regulate the heck out of these people, but we're proud of them. I mean, would be a breath of fresh air, frankly. We are not villains, you know, my, you know, we, you know, our, our like I said, our, our farm, like our farm workers are not unskilled. Our farm workers are incredibly skilled artisans that, that are at our birthday parties and, and we're at theirs and they're as close to family as, as, as anybody. And so having, having that regulatory wind at our back and some would, would really go a long ways to helping bridge the gap between, you know, kind of the farmer urban divide. And, and we're all sharing the same resources and if, 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 if some of the good stories that uh, agriculture has to offer are highlighted a little bit more, I think that would go a long way towards just building more support for, for giving people the pride in, in, in what we do. Oh, thanks for that, Derek. Lisa, anything to add on the policy or legislative side? Yes, hundreds of things. Uh, I feel like if government agencies would really treat food loss and food waste as a crisis of public health, then, you know, we could get somewhere with it. Growers could raise their yields by 20 to 40 percent in fruit and vegetable crops by simply getting everything they grow accepted into the marketplace and then distributed to the people who need it. All of these systems need support and infrastructure. They're not working well. And so I feel like if we want a healthy population that has access to and is able to utilize more than two servings of fruit and vegetables a day, uh, then we would be getting somewhere with our public health concerns. We all know we're supposed to be eating more fruit and vegetables, but if you can't get it, you don't know how to cook it or you can't afford it, you can't do it. And so when people eat such a little amount of fruit and vegetables, lots of health problems can come up. Also, I wanna point out that, you know, when we talk about tax benefits, they are, it's a patchwork across the country. It's not just one um, easy rule across the country. So I feel like if we could take the benefits we have and instead convert them into a tax credit, that would probably influence growers to donate more. Um, but further, I think that as in many states around the country, but not all, if food banks were provided a budget to, to purchase fresh produce, uh, we would get a lot further with getting fresh produce into the population uh, who can't afford it. 
Um, so, I, you know, and there's there's probably a lot more, but those are the ones I came up with right now. Appreciate anybody who's working on these things already. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, fantastic. I know we're getting close to the hour here. So I think, unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to cut the conversation and discussion. But I do really want to thank our panelists, including Maddie, but Derek and Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I know I learned a lot um, and I hope our audience did too. Um, also want to thank everybody for joining the call. As a reminder, um, this will go out in email form. So uh, keep an eye out for that. You'll be able to watch this again if you need to or want to. Um, and our next session that we're going to have in the installment is on June 30th. Um, it's going to be focusing on the second key action area, which is um, enhancing product distribution. So we'll be exploring um, topics and questions like how can sensors um, optimize routing and other technology, along with updated management procedures, really help us streamline production and increase freshness. Um, so if you have any other questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to us, of course, at insights um, at refed.com. And if you liked what you heard today, please do join the network. That 75% of you who are not in the network yet, we will keep an eye out for you and hope you do join the community. But thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all for joining. Um, we look forward to uh, connecting with you next month. Bye, everyone.